Welcome to the Sonosite webinar today titled Point of Care Echocardiography in Critical Care. It is my pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Dr. Seth Koning is the Chief of Medicine, Chief of Pulmonary Critical Care and Sleep Medicine at Kent Hospital in Rhode Island. Dr. Koenig has been interested in bringing point of care ultrasound to critical care for over a decade. His efforts and those of his associates and colleagues have helped revolutionize the way critically ill patients are managed in the US and around the globe. Dr. Koenig's research interests have led to numerous studies and publications involving point of care ultrasonography, particularly in critical care. And thank you so much for being here today, Dr. Koenig. And with that, I will turn it over to you. Thank you. Uh with all that talk, actually, I'm just a doctor who loves to take care of patients. And I think that um, that's a really important uh, part of what we do. Nothing makes me happier than being a soldier next to the battlefield of medicine. And um, all I wanna do over the next 20, 30 minutes is just share some of the ideas uh, over the years that we've built up on focusing in on critically ill patients when we need information quickly, how do we get it in the most efficient uh, manner, in the most accurate manner? And probably if you're on this, uh, this webinar, uh, this new world of ours, the Zoom world, um, you are probably already have drank the Kool-Aid and hopefully are beginning to use it or have become quite accustomed to it. And so I think uh, I've titled this, Our Patients Deserve It because and just like everything else in medicine, we wouldn't, uh, we, we, we always try to first use our history and physical in our brains, and then we go ahead and make up a differential diagnosis, and then we go ahead and use our technology to either confirm or deny what we think. So I'm just going to go through very simply some of these objectives, which, you know, most people are starting to understand maybe what constitutes point of care echocardiography, but it's important obviously for all of us to understand how it differs from our cardiology colleagues when they ask them to do an echocardiography. I think it's important to familiarize oneself with the basic echocardiographic views. And this way we speak the same language when we're talking about things. I think it's important to know what some of the resources are that are available and, in, and again, this will just be my opinion about what is necessary sort of to become competent in point of care echocardiography, because resources are one thing, but the personal sweat that we put into learning these things is really what makes folks become competent. And then I have a couple of cases I think that may drive some of these points home uh, in regards to how do we actually do it at the bedside and, and what is it that we're trying to accomplish? So what is a POCUS echocardiogram versus standard cardiology driven exam? And I think maybe there are three points. There could be more. People could probably come up with different things. But the main thing is that the clinical provider is the person who both or who performs, then interprets, and then clinically integrates the findings right then and there for that patient. And that means there's no clinical or time dissociation, and that's an important observation, meaning there's no clinical dissociation. That is, you're not asking somebody else to do an examination, which is then read by a third party who is not really invested in the, the, the patient. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just that they're not there. It's offline. And then, of course, time dissociation is the fact that you may want an echo right this, this second. It could take an hour or two to get if you're lucky. But then also there's that, that lack of time or that time when someone has to read it. And so that's the first thing. And the second thing, there's no clinical and time dissociation and the clinical provider performs and interprets and integrates the findings. But also um, a main thing is you're trying to answer an urgent question. Why is my patient in shock? Why is my patient in respiratory failure? And so all you're, what you're trying to do is use a minimal number of views to answer a clinical question. And it's sort of the basic focus of uh, echocardiogram is started with no color or spectral Doppler. And now some, some people feel minim, you know, there, there, there's a minimum amount that you can do that answers a lot of questions. And we, I can share some of that with you. So the cardiology exam, just so everybody's aware of the difference, and one of the main complaints that used to come out of 
cardiology, which is no longer. Now cardiology uh, recognizes uh, keenly the importance of, of, of appropriate hocus echocardiogram. And what I mean by that is folks who have become competent at performing it and know when they don't know and when it's time to ask for advice. And so a cardiology exam, remember, it's done exactly the same way every time. It's a full examination with lots of views, full Doppler, both color and spectral with chamber quantification, very important stuff. But if you're trying to figure out if a patient is in shock from a massive PE, it might be that you only need one view, one view that just shows a dilated not functioning very well right ventricle may be all you need, especially if you add in a DVT study and find a DVT. And that's the difference. You're asking and trying to answer a very specific question. Now, my disclaimer is not the typical disclaimer, but I want to just make sure that everybody understands that POCUS examination is not a substitute for a full, let's say, echocardiogram. It's not a substitute, it's used differently. And that's why I put here a little knowledge could be a dangerous thing and you must know what you don't know, right? And this is for everything. I think uh, everybody would agree that this, isn't, uh, this is nothing new, but it's important to reiterate because many times, and I'm fully, I have full knowledge of advanced echo. I have, I've, I've taken the exam and I still call all the time, my cardiology colleagues, and because nothing is better than having that collaborative discussion over what we're seeing. So what constitutes a POCUS echocardiogram? I think uh, people will agree that there are probably um, different ways to define this. Um, we've defined it over, uh, over the years, really with five views, with a little bit of limited color and spectral Doppler, if any. And we're gonna take a quick peek at what normals and abnormals look like. But remember, there's a parasternal long axis, a parasternal short axis, an apical four to five chamber view. There's a subcostal four chamber view and an IBC view. Now, each one of these, it's important to remember that the name is important because when you want to describe something to a colleague, you may say in the parasternal long axis, I saw the coronary sinus dilated. And that gives people the ability for the, with using the same language to understand what we're talking about. Or in the parasternal short axis, I was able to see a D sign in systole. I think there's pressure overload on the heart. And so it's important that we speak sort of similar language. And also as you become more comfortable with the language, it makes it easier when you actually read full driven, cardiology driven uh, echocardiograms because you'll understand the language a little bit, a little bit more. So I want to go through but, but with the exam, but before we go through it, I want everybody to remember that a POCUS echocardiogram without lung ultrasound to me um, is an incomplete exam. And I think a lot of people would agree that it's sort of like a pool without water. It's a non-electric car without gas. It's a plane without wings, right? So you, you get the point, it's incomplete. And that's because of the link, right? Between the pulmonary and cardiac systems. That if there's cardiac failure, many times there will be lung failure. Or if there's lung failure, you kind of want to know if there's cardiac failure because it could be a cardiogenic problem or it could be a non-cardiogenic problem. And so everybody should recognize you know, this is a normal lung. There's lung sliding, there are ribs here. I can, I can uh, see these A-lines. This is a dry lung. And if I were to see this everywhere on a patient in every, on both sides, anterior, posterior, inferior, superior, it doesn't even matter what the heart shows me in a way, because I know they're not in pulmonary edema. So if the heart is terrible, then something else is wrong if they're, if they're hypoxemic because the lung is dry. Uh, conversely, if the lung is wet and the heart is good, well, maybe you have a non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. And this is what obviously uh, the other side, if this is a normal lung on the right, these are diffuse B lines, these rockets that are shooting down 
uh, to the bottom of the screen and sort of moving with respiration. And so it's always very important to marry the two together. And so if you have wet lungs and a normal heart or, uh, or a bad heart and dry lungs, you're able to sort through some of this. So what, what questions are we asking for our pocus echo like before we get into it? Well, we definitely want to know what the left ventricular function is, right? Problem is an ejection fraction doesn't tell us a stroke volume. So you can have a poorly contracting left ventricle, but still not be in shock or in a low flow state. We see that all the time, right? Folks have AICDs in and they're, they're still doing their stuff, right? So if you're a little bit more advanced, you may ask yourself, what is the stroke volume? And really what you're asking is, is the shock because of the contractility? And that's an important consideration because it may, uh, it may make you decide what your therapeutic plan is going to be. How about the right ventricular function? Just because it's enlarged doesn't mean it's the cause of shock. And I think that's another important consideration. Um, is, are, what are the septal kinetics? Are they normal? Is there a D sign? Is there a pericardial effusion, right? And if there is one, most importantly, is it causing tamponade? And how will you distinguish just a pericardial effusion from tamponade? How about a valvular issue? What if you're hypovolemic, right? What we're trying to say here is you want to categorize your shock state. You want it to the best that you can. You want to say, is this going to be hypovolemic, hemorrhagic, distributive? obstructive, that's really what you're trying to get at with your POCUS exam. So the first view is going to be our parasternal long axis view. Our probe is sitting somewhere just to the, to the left of the sternum. And this is what we would consider a normal uh, contractility of the heart. This is the left ventricle here, the, the mitral valve, anterior, posterior, left atrium, the left ventricular outflow tract, this is the right ventricular outflow tract, and the bright line around it is going to be your pericardium. And an important structure would be to look at the descending thoracic aorta right here, because if we have a pericardial effusion or a pleural effusion, one will dictate the other. So if the if fluid comes above the aorta, it's most likely pericardial. If it comes down uh, to the bottom of the screen, it most likely is pleural. Now, the way to distinguish good and bad and a little bit bad and a little good is your eyes have to look at two different views. So if this is the normal, this we can tell is very different from the one on the left. The one on the right obviously looks different. And so there's no secret to how to figure this out. It's just that your eyes and mind have to be trained to see that, well, here, this heart is not contracting nearly as well as this heart. And I think the only way to get very good at it is to just look at the normal after normal after normal and then compare abnormals from them. So as we move on to the next view, we have what's called the parasternal short axis view. And here we've rotated 90 degrees the probe. So now we have what's considered a short axis view. These are the papillary muscles right here. You have the LV, which is nice and circular, which is very important because the interventricular septum is here. We want to look and see are all the walls coming together. And we're going to compare and contrast that with this one on the right here. This one, you have a little bit of straightening, actually, of the septum. The contractility is not nearly as good as this one. There's some fluid around the heart, which is the pericardial effusion. And so... In this case, you know, maybe the right ventricle is big. It looks like it's big even from the view. But even if you didn't know, you would say, hey, the septum is not normal. It's not rounded. That's a key thing for me. I'm going to have to do another view to try to see if the right ventricle is big or not. So then we move to the apical four-chamber view, which allows us to see the right and left ventricles next to one another. Clearly here, we see the right ventricles moving very well. Okay, this is the right ventricle. This is the left ventricle. Your mitral valves, tricuspid valves. Here, the right ventricle is much smaller than the left ventricle. On this side, you can see it is likely that the right ventricle 
is smaller than the out pouch in here, but it's definitely bigger than the one on the left. And again, you can see clearly here, this left ventricle is not contracting nearly as well as the one over here. But I wanna remind everybody, we may see severe left ventricular dysfunction, but that doesn't mean the patient's in shock. It doesn't mean if the patient is in shock that it is from the contractility. That's what we have to keep in mind. So as we move on, we have the subcostal view. And here would be a very thick subcostal view, a patient with, with a lot of hypertrophy, but left ventricle here, left atrium, right atrium, right ventricle, right ventricle is smaller than left ventricle. And here we have a right ventricle that maybe is a little bit bigger than the one over here, but it's still contracting well. How do I know that? Because I've looked at hundreds and hundreds of images and that's the point that over time, you have to get good at looking at normals so immediately your eye can tell when there's abnormals. So if we move to the next view, this is our IVC view. And I will caution people that I think most people put way too much uh, emphasis on the IVC. There's a lot of data over the years now showing that either people are incorrectly using it or it's just not as good as people thought it was as in the past. I would say though, it's a very important thing to look at because if you have a person in shock and you have a very, very tiny IVC, likely the patient's gonna need some volume. And I say likely because really, as we all know, there's nothing that's uh, foolproof, in, foolproof in medicine. And so we have to take everything with a grain of salt and use all of our views. Let's say you have someone with a very small IVC, but there's B lines everywhere. Well, that means the person's in pulmonary edema. So you may say to yourself, well, maybe the patient's volume responsive, but do I or should I give that volume? And that's a clinical question that we have to answer. So how do we become competent in POCUS, right? This is the question that people uh, ask all the time. And, you know, if you define competence as the ability to do something successfully or efficiently, you know, I've heard people tell me all sorts of things about all the gadgets that are out there that we can use and all the seminars and all the things online and videos. But I have to tell you, there is no magic. And you cannot read or watch how to perform POCUS well. Um, there are hands-on courses everywhere. And I think that is a great beginning. Right? There are hands-on courses to get you to start, but unless you spend hours and hours at the bedside, that, that uh, what you learn will go away very quickly. And so I've over the years think, uh, have thought that we need to use our colleagues. And now, as I said, cardiologists are getting much more or much less antsy about the idea that we're doing focus. In fact, um, they know that we're gonna be doing it, so maybe they ought to make sure we're doing it right. And radiology for all of the other non-cardiac ultrasonography is also a great place to, to learn from. And I started off looking to learn from some of the ultrasonographers that came to do echoes at the bedside. They were fantastic. And sometimes they're very happy to help. You know? so, so I think there's no magic. I think you have to have a probe in your hand I think there are many hands-on courses all over the country that um, can get you started. I think we have lots of colleagues and I think some of the simulators out there now can actually help you also with the hands-on acquisition of these images. So, but if you ask, how did I get good at it? I spent hours and hours at the bedside over time. And I think that's really the only way to get particularly good at doing uh, POCUS. So I wanted to go over you know, two simple cases, well, simple, two, two cases. They weren't so simple, actually. And I call it a day in the life of a POCUS physician because nothing makes me happier, as I said, uh, is that being at the bedside and trying to you know, unravel some of the mystery as to why these patients are in shock and exactly what's wrong with them. And so this was a patient who was in his late 60s and had recurrent uh, urinary tract infections because he had uh, renal calculi. And he was admitted with a positive urinalysis and was in shock. And the presumptive diagnosis downstairs 
um, was downstairs, meaning my, my emergency department, was sepsis from a potential urinary tract infection that's been recurrent, and we were consulted. And we went down and we did a POCUS. What were we expecting to see? We were expecting to see vasodilatory shock, right? So why is the patient in shock? Now, one of the things that was interesting is that the, the, the pulse pressure was pretty narrow when we saw the patient, which is a little odd for shock. But again, we put the probe on the patient. And what did we see? Well, we saw pericardial fluid. This is the parasternal long axis view. And this is fluid sitting in the pericardial space along with some, I don't know what, echogenic material within it. And there was a lot of fluid at the base of the heart. And when we zoomed in on it, you can see even more. This is the left ventricle here. The right ventricle is over here. And there's a big echo-free space that is sitting there. And if we look at another view, the subcostal view, you can see even more right in this region here. This is all posterior fluid that's sitting within the heart. There's a lot of fluid here and a lot of it's posterior. And so the question comes, is how do you know if this is tamponade? And so the, an echo cardio, a cardiology echo was performed, which saw all the things that we, we saw, but the report said no echocardiographic findings of tamponade. And the issue when I said a little knowledge is a dangerous thing is that the report's not saying that there's no tamponade. The report's saying there's no echocardiographic evidence of tamponade. But we know that tamponade is a clinical diagnosis. I had a patient in shock. I had a patient with a narrow pulse pressure. I had a patient with a fair amount of fluid around the heart. What do you do? So in this case, we decided to stick a needle in. And how did we do that? We did it under ultrasound guidance. And you will see here a wire that's coming right into that area. Now I do my pericardiosynthesis um, where there's most of the fluid. I think I've just about never done a pericardial synthesis in the sub approach because I like to do it what's most comfortable for the patient and where there's most of the fluid. So there was a lot of fluid sitting right in this area, which was sort of in like the apical four area. I put in a, a wire after getting out fluid. I then do a bubble study. And so you'll see in a moment some bubbles that come out sitting right over here. These are bubbles that I injected into the catheter to make sure that I was in the right place. And we were in the right place. And then I went ahead and searched for the catheter, which you'll see right here, uh, which is sitting right exactly where I wanted. Now, what's interesting is soon as we withdrew the first 100 or 50 cc's of fluid, the patient's blood pressure got better and the tachycardia went away. And so at the end of the day, this was cardiac tamponade, but it didn't have the echocardiographic features, Doppler features, right ventricular uh, 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 diastolic collapse that you would normally see. But the reason I put this here is that the difference is because you're at the bedside. You're the one who has to take care of this patient. You're the one that has to suffer through the idea, is this just vasodilatory shock or could there be something more there? And that's the difference between POCUS and someone else doing an echocardiogram uh, that's not at the bedside. Now, let's say the cardiologist came to the bedside and evaluated the patient, they would probably come up with the same conclusion, which is, yeah, there's no echocardiographic features of tamponade, but guess what? The patient has a fair amount of fluid around the heart and is still in shock, and we don't think it's necessarily vasodil vasodilatory shock. So that's one case. And then the second case, all of these, these were uh, that I saw literally in the last um, number of weeks and uh, months here. Um, this was a patient that was admitted for nausea, vomiting, and leg cramps had disease of the, of the coronaries, moderate to severe mitral regurgitation, moderate to severe LV dysfunction, diabetes among others, was found to be in VTAC. Came up to the ICU because he was in VTAC and he developed shock. And the question even is before we even got to him, what kind of shock is it? And he went over a few days from having a fairly normal X-ray 
to having a pretty bad looking x-ray that looked like car, almost cardiogenic, uh, excuse me, or like pulmonary edema. He was intubated and we did a bronchoscopy which showed an alveolar hemorrhage. Well, it turns out that he woke up, pulled out his femoral line and bled all over the place and lost a lot of blood. And so we're asking ourselves at the bedside, why is the patient in shock? Well, it's not so easy. Is it the heart? Is it now uh, a hypovolemic state due to um, blood loss? And remember, if you have a bad heart, you might not be able to augment cardiac output. So how do you distinguish all this stuff without making some sort of formal measurements or some, some ideas of what could be going on? Because essentially you're asking, what's the forward flow? And so basic focus, the person would be saying, is the pump failing? Yes or no. But advanced may say, or a little bit more advanced, you may say, well, what is the stroke volume of the failed pump? Maybe it looks bad, but it's actually pumping okay at the moment. A basic thing would be, well, do the valves look abnormal? But if the valves look abnormal, does that mean there's a lot of mitral regurgitation or aortic stenosis? So the advanced echocardiographer who's focus trained may say, well, maybe I need color and or spectral Doppler. And so here's the case. So here's the left ventricle and I put the normal one right here. We can start with this. I mean, I think it won't take long for your eyes to adjust to the idea that these walls, this wall here and this wall here is not coming in all that well. Another thing we look at is to see what the excursion of the mitral valve is here, that anterior leaflet. The closer it gets to the septum, the better the contractility is usually. Well, this thing hardly opens. And again, you can see on the normal up here, this mitral valve flies open. It gets very close to the septum. So this is severe left ventricular fun dysfunction, so severe. And here's the parasternal short axis with also its accompanying normal. And you can see that if I put the finger right in the middle, there's terrible contractility. There's not really that much that, it, that the chambers are coming together. In fact, there's some torsional, meaning it, it looks like it rotates a little, but it doesn't come in. And sometimes you wonder how could these people even be alive, right? But this person was very much alive. And when I went in to see the patient, they were concerned that this was cardiogenic shock and that they may need to put in a, a mechanical circulatory device. And the first thing I did was feel the guy's legs. And I noticed his legs were warm. So unless you have a warming blanket on, it is highly unlikely that that person's in cardiogenic shock. I also looked at his pulse pressure and his pulse his pressure was like 100, 100 over 50. So there's a decent wide pulse pressure there, which suggests that the forward flow might be okay. But we went ahead and said, you know, I don't want to take any of this without trying to figure it out for real. And so if this is the apical four chamber view, and everybody I think can see that this ventricle, not only does it not work well, it has probably an apical aneurysm here. It actually, when the, when the septum moves in, this part moves out. And so this is very poor function, but what I decided to do since he was warm, and since his pulse pressure was a little wide, I measured his stroke volume. And how do you do that? Well, you, you look at an apical five chamber view, the aortic valve is sitting in here. I put the Doppler right before it and I make some measurements. And I got a VTI, a velocity time integral of 14.4 centimeters. Now, what does that mean? Well, you have to know what that means. It means that a uh, normal VTI is anywhere between 18 and 22. So it's low, but it wasn't incredibly low. And I did this measurement a number of times. It got anywhere between 14 and 16 centimeters. Then I measured his, uh, uh, I measured his aortic diameter. And then I said, let's figure out his stroke volume. So if you know the aortic diameter, you can get the radius. You can do pi r squared. When you multiply pi r squared times the radius times the VTI, the number you get here, you actually get a stroke volume. And his stroke volume was about 50 or 60 per beat. And he was going about 95 to 100 beats per minute. So he had a cardiac output of about five to six liters. 
which made me feel that while he has absolutely terrible contractility and maybe he was in cardiogenic shock when he first came in, he currently wasn't. Then I said, you know, maybe we can actually figure out what his left atrial pressure is because he has this pulmonary edema pattern. And so I did some color Doppler and this blue flame here is the mitral regurgitation that he has, which is severe. It wraps all the way around to the back of the left atrium. And when I put Doppler across it, I can measure the velocity of this blood shooting into the left atrium. And I don't wanna to get too technical, but as you become more comfortable with this, he had an A-line in. And at the moment I did this view, his systolic pressure was 120. I got a, 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 the maximum velocity from the Doppler of 4.4 meters per second. If I use Bernoulli's equation, I can figure out the pressure gradient across that valve, which was 77 millimeters of mercury. So if I know the systolic pressure and I know the left atrial pressure, I can, excuse me, the, the, the pressure gradient across the valve from the MR jet if you subtract the two, that gives you your left atrial pressure, which was 43 millimeters of mercury. What does that mean? It means the guy had a very high left atrial pressure, which was the reason for his pulmonary edema. And so again, this just shows you that depending upon where you are in that journey in POCUS, whether you're at the beginning of it, the middle, whether you want to learn more, I think that it's not hard to do these measurements. It's much harder to get good at getting the five or six basic views that you're gonna to wanna to make sure that every patient to the best of your ability you can get. And the last thing I, I wanted to, to say is what are our future directions in the field of POCUS? We believe as the folks who teach a lot of this that everybody should learn how to do a basic POCUS exam and probably should learn eventually how to do a VTI you know, basic color Doppler. But let's face it, there are going to be patients who you're never going to be able to see the heart with from doing an external uh, exam, a, a TTE. And in our minds, uh, you know, my colleagues, you should always do your best to evaluate the heart, right? I mean, I mean, if you don't know what the heart is doing in a patient in shock, you can't be entirely sure what's happening. And so we say, if the TTE has poor windows, then all the patient needs is an esophagus. And why do we say that? Because we can do a TEE. And this was a patient that, uh, that I did a TEE in because I thought that the little bit that I could see that the patient had a reverse Takasubo. The patient actually had cardiac arrest in a restaurant after choking on a piece of meat and was in shock. And if we let this play, this is called a mid-esophageal four-chamber view. It's upside down because now we have the probe inside the esophagus and we're looking from behind. And this is the apex of the heart, which is contracting really well. But if you look carefully, the mid and base is doing nothing. And this person had a, only a mildly elevated troponin and a mildly abnormal EKG. This is a classic reverse Takasubo that once I saw the heart like this, I was able to start adding in the therapy that I needed to do to ensure that the cardiac output was gonna be adequate for this patient. And I will say that's part of the future direction is learning how to do TEE. We know that we now have a critical care, advanced critical care echo exam, a board exam. I sit on that writing committee and I can tell you we talk all the time about TEE. There are questions on it about TEE. I can tell you that cardiologists are starting to recognize that non-cardiologists can competently do TEE. Uh, the COVID really showed us this. And so the last thing would be lung ultrasound, believe it or not, with transesophageal control. It is amazing how well you can see posterior consolidations with TEE. So a lot of times on these big people that you don't have good windows on who are in ARDS and you want to know how to set your PEEP or how to set, uh, how, to, how to look at the PEEP and see what its effect is having on the right heart, you can put in the probe, turn up your PEEP, go back and forth, look at the lungs, see if you're recruiting them, look at the heart, see if you're hurting them and go back and forth. 
And I think that uh, these are the future directions when it comes to focus. I think I'm going to stop here and uh, I will entertain uh, any questions. Um, hopefully most of them are regarding POCUS, um, but I hope you enjoyed sort of this little uh, dog and pony uh, trip down, uh, down the POCUS lane and uh, uh, hope to answer some of your questions. And I thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Koenig for that great presentation and for sharing those two interesting cases. That's, that's always, I think, really helpful in these situations. Uh, we do have a few questions actually. Um, I'm going to just dive right in. Uh, one of them is sort of piggybacking on your second case you talked about. Uh, how much quantitative assessment do you use in your in in your POCUS in the ICU, like calculation of ETI assessing for assessing hemodynamics, right. all of that, you know, passive leg right, raise um, or response to vasopressors and inotropes? Right. I think it's a great question because um, what I would say is I do the least amount necessary to get the answer that I want. So I would say that eight, seven or eight out of 10 POCUS cardiac exams, I never have to turn on Doppler and I never have to turn on color because it is evident to me that just with the five uh, views, I know exactly what's happening. I see a hyperdynamic heart or I see a gigantic right ventricle with the right clinical conditions and a DVT. You don't really need too much more than that. And that's the beauty of focus when you get good at it. I think that when I'm using more advanced techniques, it's really when I want to ask myself, patient's in shock, LV doesn't look great. What is the stroke volume? Because if the stroke volume is low, I might want to use an ionotrope. And then if I use an ionotrope, then I'm going to recheck the VTI and see if the stroke volume went up. If it did, I'll continue to do that until we reach a plateau. Mm -hmm. And so the second reason would be, well, let's say the valves look particularly bad and I want to know if there's torrential mitral regurgitation or torrential aortic stenosis, because we don't really care too much in critical care, whether there's you know, minimal or moderate amount of MR or minimal or moderate amount of AI. That might be extremely important for the patient but it's probably not the reason that the patient would be in shock. And I think that's the really important part. So it's important, but it's much more important to be able to use the five basic views to the best of your ability. That's sort of how I would answer that. Okay, great, that helps, thank you. Um, are you using ECG with your echocardiograms and how are you utilizing ECG? Yeah, we used to do it for just about everyone. And then we realized that again, um, it doesn't really need to be used in critical care. I think that when we are trying to teach a point about where the motion of the valves are or is there diastolic collapse of something, it's nice to have that uh, ECG on there. But in fact, it's not necessary. And it just goes in and it complicates the whole purpose of a focus exam, which is to get in and get out as quickly as possible with answering the question that you're supposed to answer. So I definitely don't dissuade people from using it. I definitely have used it. There's nothing wrong with it, but I don't think it's necessary. And in fact, that is kind of what we're teaching uh, recently. Right, okay. Um, do you know about the critical care echocardiogram boards? And what are your thoughts on the best way to prepare for it? Yeah, so I definitely know about the critical care echocardiographic uh, boards. <laughs> um, I've written the exam for the past three or four years now. It's been, it, it's really wonderful that we have it. It legitimizes the field of non-cardiology driven echo. And it shows that non-cardiologists, if you take an interest in it, can become proficient. I would say that um, you need a few things. Um, you need a mentor. You need somebody who's going to be able to help you through the process. And again, if you're not in a place that's, that um, you have cardiologists that are willing to help, it becomes a little bit more difficult. The ACCP, the American College of Chest Physicians, and I think some of the other societies are starting to come out with um, review uh, questions and actually review courses that are very helpful to look at the materials that you would need uh, in order to do this. There's also 
a lot of decent books out there that, um, you know, some of the review books for the echo exams that even cardiologists take uh, that are very helpful. We, have, we actually have uh, the, Amer the, the chest organization, the American College of Chest Physicians, we also have actually an advanced echo course. It's a, it's a two to three day course, depending upon which year, if you're COVID or non-COVID, where we focus in on trying to educate people on uh, more advanced things. I can tell you in reality, if you can get good at the five views, and then you start looking online and looking at some of the resources that we can see, you'll start to easily develop the hand-eye coordination, the rest of its cognitive development, which you actually can do by reading a lot of different books. Right, I'm, I'm looking at hmm. some more questions in the chat. There's, they're coming in in multiple places. So just a reminder, everyone, if you could post your questions in the Q&A box, that it makes it a little easier to, to track what's been answered and what hasn't been. <clears throat> Um, so how is quality of the exams being insured credentialing? That's a credentialing question. So that's a, that's a great question. I'm curious, uh, you know, who asked the question simply because it, it's, um, it's, uh, it, it's such an important thing as POCUS has, has, has gone every place now, most places are using POCUS in some manner. And so I can only tell you it's evolved in our, in our divisions by um, first and foremost, you need to have an archiving system. You need to be able to store your images for, uh, to vet, be vetted by a mentor. So the first thing that, that for, for quality is you have to be able to go over the images with somebody who's going to say, hey, yeah, that's, that's a good one. Or hey, no, that's not a good one. So that requires, in terms of, of quality, that also means you have to have somebody who knows what they're doing. So you have to have a few people who are mentors. You have to have a archiving device or some way that the individuals can start to build up a portfolio, and you need to have interaction between them. What we do is we have a little pretest, cognitive, hands-on. We have a didactic sessions. We do hands-on training. Then we... We'll do a hands-on test, little cognitive test, and then they have to, the, the, the POCUS people will have to give us a small portfolio. Once the portfolio is done, we go over it, and if all things look decent, we will credential you in basic POCUS and then require you every year to give us an updated um, uh, you know, portfolio to make sure for ongoing. The, the third thing that's really important is to have regular POCUS conferences where people are bringing their cases and you're going over them and using them as unknowns. And, and, and you know, you have to have all of these, I think, and most people that I work with pretty much do, you know, some iteration of what we just talked about. Right, yeah, that makes sense. Um, there's some comments in the chat about SCCM and CHEST having uh, courses as well. Um, right. Think about that. Yeah, no, that's what I was saying. I think all the major societies right. are starting to have these courses, not even starting, they've been around for some time now. We started our first course through CHEST in, in 2006. And I think we were the first, but, but again, I shouldn't say we, I mean, I'm just saying at general, that's where we start, it started. Mm -hmm. And I think just about every major society has as POCUS uh, courses. Really all you want to do is you want to get to a course where you're going to have the most hands-on experience as possible. So they're out there. Right, thank you. Um, so I have a few questions coming at me at the same time. Um, what do you think about the devices that attach to a phone? Um, this person's heard that Mayo is doing a lot of that. <laughs> so Paul Mayo is my, my, uh, my dear friend. Uh, and my mentor, I, I wouldn't be talking to you right now if it wasn't for him. Um, uh, so I don't think he uses it a lot. I would say that he has one. There are two or three decent devices out there. New ones are coming out all the time. I think the, the real question is, in my mind, is how, how accurate is a portable device that's handheld and how do people train? Should you train on a portable device? 
I think every, lots of people have different opinions about this. Um, I think that the portable devices, when used appropriately, will answer many questions in a, in a quick manner at the, bed, at the bedside. That is if you've had proper training. I think you can learn on them. I've seen people learn on them, but I think that the best way is to have a, a formal, you know, to have to have some education on some of the bigger machines that allow you to do things. It's sort of like learning um, classical music and then venturing out into other areas as opposed to just picking up an instrument and trying to learn. I think they they're all have good and bad qualities to them. Um, and I think they can be used. I just caution people to really, really make sure that, the, that, that, what, you're, that what you're doing with that probe, um, you're doing in a, in, in a good manner. Right, so do you have any particular learning materials that you would recommend for a new graduate PA looking to utilize focus more in clinical practice? In the yeah, that's a great question. And fortunately or unfortunately, the satisfactory answer is, is really, it's the, there's no difference for APPs in my opinion. So my APPs go through the same course that I teach my fellows and residents and attendants. Um, my APPs are fully competent in point of care ultrasound simply by, they all went to a, a get started course, you know, like through SCCM or through chest or whatever it is, you get your two, three days, then they came back. We had more didactics. We, I had them do pretty extensive portfolios. We had the same uh, things that I were talking about for quality assurance, which is they bring cases. I vet them for them. And uh, over time, I can tell you, um, they are just as good as anybody else is at doing point of care ultrasound. So I would say, I wouldn't distinguish yourself in any way. I would say you're a clinical provider and you can learn just like everybody else. Great, thank you. Um, how do you approach an unexpected finding? Uh, for example, finding a value problem when looking for pericardial effusion. That's a, that's a great question, right? So um, I approach it um, the way I approach every other thing that we do, which is, I mean, we find unexpected things all the time. On a, let's say on a CAT scan, let's say you were doing a CAT scan for a pulmonary embolus and you find a nodule, right? You can't mm -hmm. ignore it. And so if I found, uh, if I'm looking for a pericardial effusion and I notice that there's you know, moderate to severe mitral regurgitation likely due to a leaflet problem, uh, I'm gonna get a full examination. I'm gonna call the cardiologist and say, well, I was looking for a pericardial effusion, but I think this person has a mitral or aortic valve problem. Please come evaluate. I also think it's important to say, when I began doing this, you never wanna be cavalier about what you think you know. Um, I, I would constantly, constantly call my colleagues, whether they were cardiologists or Paul Mayo, because he was, a, you know, when I was learning, he was, a, he was already an expert. And I didn't stop doing that. First of all, actually, I should say, I've never stopped doing that. It all depends on what I'm trying to do now. So I will find things on transesophageal echo and call up the cardiologist. I'm like, look, this guy's got to go to the operating room. And they'll come down, take a look and agree or disagree with me. And then we move people along. But I'm still having that conversation. So I think that, like I said before, it's most important to remember to, to, to think about what you don't know. So if you see something that, that doesn't look right and it wasn't what you intended, then you get somebody to come to the bedside with you to help answer that exam. Right. And how many exams would you say it takes for one to get competent? Well, that's a great question too. I think it depends on what you're trying to get competent in. If you're trying to get competent in just general focus, okay, um, it, it's going to vary between people, but we found maybe 30 to 50 exams is probably pretty good at getting pretty competent at all of the things that, uh, that you would probably see. Um, but I think it's very different. It's, it's different for every person, which is why competence is so hard. Competent, you only know you're competent when you're competent. Like you have to have that hands-on exam and that cognitive ability that only comes with time. Some people get it in two months, some people take a year, and then there's everything in between. But I would say for, for image acquisition part, which is the thing that you have to have first, it's probably somewhere between 30 and 50 exams. 
because remember, you want all different body types, right? You don't want just a skinny person who's on a ventilator. You want to have all different types of people before you can say, hey, I'm, I'm competent to do these exams. Right. Makes sense. Um, and I want to get back to a little bit of the TEE uh, material that you talked about. How do you see TEE, TEE advancing in the ICU setting? So I think that we're breaking down barriers. I think that m many people who do POCUS would agree with the idea that not seeing the heart in a patient with shock, you lose something. You lose a tremendous advantage. So if you ask folks that now and you say, well, you can't see it with a TTE, what are you gonna do? They would, a lot of people would say the same thing. Well, if I could just do a TEE, I would do it. And so we've learned that TEE is really safe, like really safe. It would take me 27 years if I did a TEE on one person, 27 years in a row, every single day before I really hurt them. That's pretty good safety profile. So that's number one. Number two, it's easier than transthoracic once you understand transthoracic. The actual getting of the views is so much easier because the esophagus just sort of hugs the probe. Um, number three, cardiologists are starting to recognize that we're able to do it. And so I think as more and more uh, ultrasound machines develop the capability to take the portable ones, the ones that we use on a regular basis for point of care ultrasound can very well do TEE. And all of the things that you would want, Doppler and color, um, they, are, they are very, very good quality TEEs. And the probes that, that you can get with them are the same thing. They, they're exactly the same as a cardiology driven TEE. I would say that it's coming because as more people develop competence in advanced critical care echo, there's no denying that you already have the cognitive ability to do it. And it's also, it's really hard to argue that it's not safe. Any critical care or ED provider will not a hundred times in a row say it's much more dangerous to intubate somebody than it is to do a TEE. So if we're able to intubate somebody, really it's easy to do a TEE. So more to come. Right, and you mentioned lung ultrasound in, in that. Lung right, exactly. Um, what exactly. about additional, additional uses for TEE? Um, so, I, so I've done many things. I put in, so when I put in, uh, uh, let's say for instance, all my ECMO patients, I use TEE to guide placement, every single one. We never take the patient to the operating room. We never take the patient to the cardiac cath lab. It's all done on a TEE control. When I, um, put in, for instance, in an intubated patient, if I want to put in a transvenous pacer, I will put the TE probe in because you can beautifully see the advancement of, of the wire exactly where you want it to be. And again, same thing with the severe ARDS patient. Even if I can see the heart, sometimes I'll do a TEE because it allows me to see the lungs in a manner that you, you can't. I mean, I've seen cases where we picked up an empyema only on TEE because we couldn't see it on regular transthoracic and we couldn't move the patient because the patient was too sick. So I think people, um, you know, they, people are really smart and they, and they sort of, it just all of a sudden you're like, wait a minute, maybe the TEE will answer that question. We do bubble studies with it all the time. We do lots of things with TEE. That's fantastic. Um, we had some cheers for ECMO uh, while you were talking. <laughs> That's really great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, so you did mention, obviously, lung, lung evaluation in TE. Can you speak a little bit more about that? I just wanted to, I didn't want to brush over that. Yeah, so, so uh, we, we know that early on, and there's controversy uh, uh, about doing recruitment maneuvers. I think most people, I mean, I, I, mean, I ran an ECMO center for a long time and, a, and, a, and an ARDS center, and I think a lot of people would agree that early on, the first 24 hours, if you intubate a patient, the lungs, if you have the ability to recruit lung in an open lung model for ARDS, that's the time to do it. And so the, you want to you wanna do it in the safest manner because we know that 30 to 50% of patients in ARDS develop right ventricular failure just from the ARDS and being on a ventilator. So we know that if you start to ramp up the peak, you may create more of a problem than you fix. 
So the TEE allows you to see the lungs in a manner with which you can't in any other way. Um, it, it's so beautiful that you actually can watch recruitment happen as you turn the peep up. If you do a recruitment maneuver over 30 or 40 seconds, you will literally watch the lung go from consolidated and then it starts to become B lines. And then before you know it, the lung may be inflated with B lines instead of uh, consolidated and down. And a lot of times you may even see the right ventricle start to bulge a little bit and you get worried, but then as the lung recruits, all of a sudden blood flow is, is, is better and your pulmonary vascular resistance goes down and your RV says, ah, and things are a little bit better. And so, um, you know, it's, you don't need to do it every single day for every single patient. You need to know the technology that you have that answers the question again in the most efficient and safe manner. And TEE is so safe. Right. Uh, well, we are basically at the top of the hour, but I, I wanted to ask you one more question, if you don't mind. Um, what are your feelings about AI in Focus Echo? It's a great question. I think, um, so my, my partner, Paul, used to tell me it's a bunch of, bunch of nonsense, right? He would say to me, but that's because um, this was, you know, he had to learn it the old fashioned way, which is there were no videos, there was no YouTube, there was no nothing. It was, here's a book, a still image, and he had to try to put together uh, what he thought was an appropriate evaluation. I think that all of these new things have a place I think that AI, I have used it, I have seen it. I think um, it can be helpful, but I caution what, what the most important thing I think is I just caution people that sometimes the good old fashioned way of learning is still the best way of learning. And then you augment that learning with all of the other things like AI. I don't think there's anything wrong with it. Technology is gonna continue to grow. And I love technology, but I think that you have to be mature enough. And I mean that in the most respectful way, the mature enough in whatever it is that you're doing to use these things appropriately. All right, that makes sense. Great. Well, thank you so much for your time today. Uh, I am gonna let everyone know that uh, this, will, will be this is being recorded and will be posted on our website. Uh, I'm gonna share the screen here that shows you where it will be posted. So right here at the bottom of the screen, you should see our uh, the link where the webinar will be posted. Um, but thank you so much, Dr. Koenig. I've really appreciated your time today. I think you've shared a lot. Uh, I know I learned a lot and uh, I thank you very much. Very welcome. Be well. You too, <laughs> bye-bye.